you all know, Dane is recording this on Zoom for the folks that will be here um, to listen. Also, so you can come back and revisit perhaps some of the things that, that you heard um, and wanted to come back and, um, and listen to again. Um, so first of all, um, I want to thank the four of you for taking time out of your day um, to be with us today. Um, you know, two hours is a big chunk. <laughs> You're all busy people. Um, and so um, we just wanted to, to acknowledge um, your time uh, here with us. Um, a little bit about, about the, the group and, and the context of the course. Um, so these are all master's students who are also teaching. Um, in some folks are here at Boulder Journey School. Some folks are at other schools around Boulder or in Denver. Um, this course is focused on helping teachers explore and examine the different relationships and connections between a child, family, um, community, and sort of larger systemic issues that influence the life um, and experience of a child and of a family. And so, again, we, we thought that this panel would be really great to, to offer up different perspectives. You know, Jane and I are, are just two people, and so we wanted to create an opportunity um, to hear um, some other voices um, in different contexts that we don't necessarily occupy. Um, and so with that, um, we can do uh, maybe some quick teacher introductions as far as like um, where you teach um, and what age you work with. Um, and then for the panelists, we would love to hear um, your name, um, the organization you work for, your role, um, and then we'll have another question for you answer alongside that. But I want to give the teachers an opportunity to do um, so, some quick introductions so you, you can get a little bit of a sense of where they where they teach and who they teach. Anyone want to start? We'll start back over here. Marissa. Um, hi, my name is Marissa. I work here at the Journey School in the preschool room with three four-year-olds. Hi, I'm Nina. Um, I also work here um, in preschool with three four-year-olds. Okay, well, okay. Um, <laughs> I work at Southern Journey School here in Northern Falls, Oregon, with children. I'm Liz, and I work here, and I am with three and four year olds. <laughs> okay, let's see, and I work here at the school in the older infants' classrooms. Um, into one month. Um, and so 
through this exploration, we've been um, inviting teachers to think about what uh, community connections, um, what community means to them, what does it look like um, to kind of keep those connections between child, family, and community sort of at the heart of their, um, of their teaching. And so one of the assignments for this course is um, community, where we're inviting this, the teachers to think about what a community-based project could be. Um, some of the options, there are four options. Um, one is to um, reflect on what the teachers gain from their experience in Reggio. So this Boulder Journey School and the Teacher Education Program is based um, on the Reggio Emilia philosophy of education, and they've all had a chance to go to Reggio Emilia Italy um, and learn about um, the philosophy. And so just to continue their thinking about what, how Reggio, sort of that system, engages in community and, and compare and contrast with what could happen here. Um, they've also been working on um, the spring semester, of course, um, advanced developmentally advanced curriculum. Is it that right? Advanced developmental. Advanced developmental. Yes, thank you. ADAC. I like to say. I just know the acronym. Sure. Um, where they've been, they've been developing, learning about and developing curriculum for their classroom. As part of that, they've also been invited to think about what that extension into the community could look like. So part of the course, they could continue working on those threads that they've developed um, over the course of um, the spring semester, um, or, or they could do something completely different, something totally outside of the scope of those options. So we've left it open enough so if you might get uh, questions and things that are, could seem really random, but it's based on the openness that we provided and the choice that we provided for them to um, take on their project based on what's interesting um, to them and the, the needs um, and the assets that they see for their families. So, um, yeah, so if we could just share your name, your role, um, the organization you work for, and what community you to be in. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Darcy Kuching. And um, there are two organizations listed in my bio that we received today, Places Make People, which is my own uh, consulting organization, and Walk to Connect, which is a Denver-based cooperative that I'm a member owner of. Um, everything you're doing speaks deeply to my heart. I also have a Master of Education. I focused on Montessori education in my background, so I focused on early childhood. And I have um, a, a master's degree in urban planning, and I studied seven long years for a PhD in children's environments. So I'm very interested in what you're doing. And I have a lot to share if you have questions about, well, we'll see. But yes, what community means to me? So, <laughs> community to me means, um, I mean, of course, it has many different definitions, but in the context of what we're talking about today, I'd say that um, community is the space in which um, families, children, families, and people across the lifespan feel that they belong. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Matta. Um, I work here at a company called Sunrise Strategic Partners, which is a venture capital fund based in Boulder. Um, we make investments in natural food veteran firms, so uh, generally speaking, kind of trying to be anything that's better for you, organic, and healthy, kind of leading the trends in the food beverage categories. Um, my role there, or I guess my title there, is, is Vice President of Operations and Finance, which is one of those titles that doesn't really do anything. Um, <laughs> so I, I tend to split my time between kind of doing work, uh, analyzing and getting to know the companies and teams before we invest, and then working with them also after we invest to help um, kind of optimize for growth and continued success. Um, so my background is almost exclusively finance and accounting. Uh, so I studied in undergrad at Boston College and then worked in New York for four years um, before doing some traveling and consulting. Um, so um, outside of that, though, I do want to add, because I think you mentioned this as I was walking in for, I do a lot of work on the side, um, just of personal passions, uh, engaging with tech stars and the local startup community. Um, I helped organize for Startup Week and organize the Startup Weekend around food and technology. Um, and I also volunteer for a nonprofit in Denver called the Grow House, which is using indoor farming technology to provide um, greater access to healthy food in a low income, um, otherwise heavily polluted area. 
Uh, so kind of trying to you know be involved as much as I can. Um, and what community means to me, uh, again, it's kind of tough. Um, and I thought about this, and I think that where I came up with or where I landed was that I view community as like a shared experience um, with people who have somewhat of a shared value system and, and shared interests in the ongoing kind of growth and progress of that community. Um, and you can, I think, get as niche or as broad as you want in that definition, uh, even looking at Boulder, where communities can be very small groups or very large groups. But I feel like those are kind of defining characteristics of that, where it is a kind of shared experience with um, particular. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Erica Turley. Um, I serve as the Director of Native American Services at the University of Northern Colorado, which is in Germany. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, let's see. Um, I am an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, which is a tribal community in that spans Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Um, it's larger than this uh, Western Canada. A little bit of perspective of what that community looks like. Um, let's see. Other things that might be important. Um, I was really in college. <laughs> 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 uh, so, um, I think interestingly enough, the reason why we, we, we became roommates um, was that uh, so we both went to Colorado College, which is a predominantly white institution. Uh, and we both lived in what's called the glass house. Uh, and so it's always a sense of belonging that I felt at CC um, when I became a member of that community. Um, so yeah, it's pretty it's dear to my heart. Uh, but when I think and want to dissect the board community, I think it truly comes to a sense of belonging and a connection to other humans um, without any kind of assumptions about um, who that human is. Um, and so, um, I think in addition to that, I should probably introduce myself to Uh, yes, I shared the training with the team of the Shrimp which team also identified as the Shrimp Academy professional. And so, in the Navajo community, it's important to share your tribal um, <clears throat> introduction, which signifies and kind of relays um, all of the women that I am a part of. So you basically got my entire matrimonial line um, and heritage. So you not only know who I am, but you also know where I come from. Um, and so that sense of um, space is even expanded beyond kind of the physical to kind of something that like also captures time um, and um, familial bonds. So, quick, quick question. I think I'm so deep until you want to translate for us. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, it, Basically, it breaks down into um, I am a member of the Red House People Clan, born for the Towering House People Clan. My uh, maternal grandfather is of uh, the um, Red House People Clan, and my paternal grandfather is of uh, the Mexican people. So, there you go. <laughs> it's been a while since I've uh, <laughs> translated that. <laughs> So my first question is, who's watching your kids? <laughs> <laughs> so we're, uh, we have two cohorts. We have an AM and a PM. So the AM um, take class while these guys do. Uh, yeah. And now they're in class. And AM oh, no. so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now they're just going to do it. Thanks for having all of us. I'm Chris Barge uh, with the Community Foundation of Boulder County. Um, my title is Vice President of Strategic Initiatives, which makes about as much sense as Joe's title. <laughs> um, one of the things I do, because I'm a former uh, reporter for the Rocky Mountain News and Daily Gambler, is I headed our trends report, which is the indicators project that looks at the social economic environmental health of Boulder County. Um, so you get it for putting out for me today is a free copy of my magazine. <laughs> Which I'll just ask somebody for help. Now. Uh, uh, so, uh, the, the Community Foundation is a place based foundation. It's one of 700 in the country. The Community Foundation concept is an American invention. It started about 100 years ago in Cleveland. 
uh, we are all place based, and so the place that we serve is all over county, which is maybe more in cities and towns, stretching from the Continental Divide up to Longmire. Um, and uh, <clears throat> some of my work, in addition to this, has been involved uh, with a Latino parent engagement program that we incubated uh, called El Paso. Uh, a year ago, you had someone representing that. Uh, you did, yeah. uh, which I directed until it flipped out on its own, uh, given it a nonprofit um, a year ago. Uh, so we had a, a school readiness initiative, which is focused on education equity and closing the achievement gap uh, for about seven years now. Uh, and basically, our community foundation has a vision of equity um, for communities in our county. Uh, we try to live by our core values which is nothing about me without me, uh, resident leadership, uh, standing with the vulnerable and marginalized, and believing that we can accomplish more together than alone. Uh, so everything we do tries to tie into that. Um, what does community mean to me when I was a newspaper reporter? It either meant a physical place or it meant a topic of interest. And I think we've all touched on that. Uh, another way of putting that is considered a place where we bring ourselves families and networks together. Um, and in my idealistic world, a community is a welcoming and inclusive place where diversity is valued and strived for, a place where everyone has the same chance to become their best self, regardless of race, ethnicity, or famous financial status, a place where government plays a necessary role, a healthy press holds a mirror up to us and holds us all accountable for walking our time. Thank you. Fun fact, I'm sure. Oh, I was a newspaper reporter too before I did this. <laughs> I was at the Omaha World Herald. Yeah. The Omaha World Herald for a number of years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should, yeah, it's good. <laughs> no, no, it's just not. Um, so, uh, thank you all for sharing uh, your, your perspective, perspectives and a little bit um, of your backgrounds. Um, one of the questions that we had for you all um, in thinking about, right, the, the way that we've crafted this course is to, again, focus on, um, on that sense of empathy and curiosity, um, as well as use an asset-based lens. Um, when thinking about working with um, and engaging with community. And so with that asset-based lens, like what, what are the assets that you see in the community? What is working well? What, um, you know, what, what space uh, are different community members or communities like holding? What are, what are they doing well? What are we doing well? Well, if you want to define, uh, define the, <laughs> uh, if you want to define the, the community as, as Boulder, uh, which it sounds like we're kind of doing in this question, um, we have a great number of assets that I think are pretty objectively observable. We have a beautiful natural environment that people, you know, brings people here. Right? A lot of people come to the Boulder area because it's gorgeous. Um, we have, uh, just from my, my own kind of closer perspective, um, I've been doing a lot of work with Boulder Housing Partners, which is our local public housing agency, and they are an incredible asset to this community. They bring resources and partners from all different aspects of families' lives into their uh, communities. And each, each sort of housing um, area is a community unto itself. And of course, both housing partners as whole as community. Um, but that to me is an incredible asset for families in our community, especially because, and this is one of the uh, the detractors rather than the assets is that we don't have sufficient affordable housing here in Boulder. So that is a negative for families and something that really presents uh, problems. Um, so yeah, beautiful natural assets, which um, we can't overlook as something that's important to children's development. Um, and a good public housing agency are two really top assets that, I, that I've identified. Um, yeah, I should, I should add that for myself. I am relatively new to Boulder. Uh, I moved here last April, so I've only been in Boulder for a little over a year. Um, and I 
And so thinking about this question, you know, I don't know, <laughs> not to put the like businessman kind of hat on, but um, when we think about like identifying assets, one of the most important people. And I think that the, the quote unquote like human capital here in Boulder is among the best that I've ever kind of been around. Um, I think on the negative side, it could use a bit more diversity, certainly, uh, especially coming from a place like New York, um, which might be on one end of the spectrum. Um, you know, the holder, I think, can certainly benefit from that. But um, just kind of setting that aside for a moment, I've never been in a place that I think in such a, for such a small city, the quality of knowledge and uh, experience um, across a broad range of, of, of areas. I'm not talking just business anymore. I mean, we talk about outdoors, education, I mean, the nonprofit environment here. I think that people are on, um, you know, for like a better way to describe it, another level here um, relative to others. And I think that's a huge asset in bringing all those people together, all that experience and that knowledge together can really be powerful. Um, and so, to me, I, I feel like that's one of the, the, the kind of key foundations of, of what has made Boulder so great. Um, and I will say I've found, in my experience at least, that all those people, if you approach them, are willing to share and help, uh, which is one of the kind of key tenets I think of building that community is, is people who want to give back and want to share their knowledge. Um, so. I like the great thing, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> You know all the ways that you all define community, communities of practice, and communities of like place, communities of like interest, communities of like whatever it is. Right? So, yeah, and so like um, to frame it from like, specifically the place in which I live, um, I think one of the things I appreciate about community is its attempt to try. So like, there's this actual campaign. Uh, and so, like, one of the things that pressures me about that simultaneously while it also makes me excited about kind of the potential and uh, the connection that exists with the group is that um, due to kind of stereotypes and kind of assumptions made about the space and the place in which it um, is placed, um, that there's an entire, like, campaign that needs to be created in order to offer this space any form of dignity. Uh, and so I simultaneously pride myself on the fact that Katie is extremely proud of itself and proud of the community that exists there. It's extremely diverse, um, that a lot of people don't get a credit for. Um, simultaneously, there's um, an upheaval of economic growth and care. Um, and so I think kind of that ethic of um, connection um, is very vibrant there. Um, so I also kind of simultaneously envy Boulder for it. Um, because I think Boulder, um, again, simultaneously is the beacon, but oftentimes not really recognizing all the resources that are readily available um, due to its location, um, due to kind of the consumption of the, the natural resources that are available. Um, so it, it, I, I struggle and I'm constantly at odds um, with kind of the ways in which Colorado itself um, kind of capitalizes on and simultaneously, um, I don't know, I wrestle a lot with Colorado just in general. Um, but I also equally participate in consuming the grief of Colorado. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> I like this contrast between Boulder and really um, we could talk about so many Colorado paradoxes and when you talk about a, a really unexpected campaign you're talking about an aspiration for a town that might be known someday as how Joe described Boulder people are on another level here and yet also this pride in the diversity. And you hear in Joe this uh, reflection, I came from New York, come on, like, where's the diversity? And uh, I think we're both looking at the grass is greener on the other side. From Boulder, we look at Greeley and we see the diversity and that vibrancy. From Greeley, they look over to Boulder and they see the economic engine and just the constant churn of intellectual and financial capital coming through here. Um, and so, 
um, I, I think that, you know, one thing I like, one thing I do is I, I go around the county, whoever is working on something to improve community and wants to hear a presentation about what we learned in our trends indicator report. Uh, I go and give a talk which helps lay the context for where they're working and what they're working on and seeks to help them uh, take their conversation and their strategy to wherever it needs to get to now. And, um, you know, one of the things I talk about, another Colorado paradox is that we have uh, a, a place that so many Anglos are attracted to, uh, here particularly in Boulder, uh, for the outdoor recreation opportunities. And yet we also know that if you are uh, Latino in particular, you're more likely to have been born in Colorado than in New England at this mm. point. But that's a fact. Uh, and yet sort of what's driving us uh, to come here uh, is, or stay here, uh, is very different. Um, on one hand, it might be an entrepreneurial atmosphere or a recreational uh, set of opportunities. On the other hand, uh, might have more to do with this is this is where my family is and, and this is where I live. Um, when you talk about assets, I mean, I would talk about strong Latino family structures. I would talk about a thriving arts scene. The National Endowment for the Arts recently cited numbers of found in Boulder. Uh, had more per capita artists in it than anywhere outside Santa Fe or Los Angeles. Uh, we, um, let's see, have a strong intellectual community. Um, there are more uh, higher density of women with advanced degrees in Boulder, Colorado than anywhere in the nation. Uh, we have a thriving and uh, well-diversified business community. That, as Joe said, is very uh, quick, particularly in the entrepreneurial space, to uh, spend a minute helping someone you haven't met before on a project that uh, they could use your help with. We have clean water being so close to the Continental Divide. Mississippi wishes they had water as clean as our And we have uh, you know, open space, uh, having passed the first, uh, I think we were, we were the second open space tax in the country after the fourth one. Both around 1962 when we started that. Uh, gorgeous outdoor vistas and recreation, and uh, overall wealthy. Uh, our average income in uh, Boulder County is about 50% higher than the national average. However, that's not shared across race and ethnicity, uh, uh, particularly Latino is our largest minority population here, and uh, they do not share that uh, same. Uh, increase compared to Latinos nationally, it's about the same. Uh, and overall, we have a very healthy population. So those are some answers. Um, now we want to, uh, we spent time talking about what what is really working, what is right, what are the assets of the community. Um, you all have highlighted already in some of your comments, sort of what are what are some of the issues, um, some of the challenges, or some of the threats. Um, sort of all of those um, different meanings and different words um, for community in general and also communi specific communities. Um, Chris, I appreciate your perspective of, of really, you know, naming sort of how different communities are living within, like, within Boulder, within, you know, Eric, how you mentioned, you know, the diversity and really, um, you know, and, and some of your other contexts as well. So, so what are, what are some of the challenges that that are basically. Um, I can jump in. Okay. Um, I think I'll say two things. Uh, one, again, kind of staying like the, the kind of entrepreneurial business environment is as much as I think as strong as the community is here around that, um, when that community has been built over time, and that's actually not even just true of Boulder, I think this is true to the broader. Uh, universe of startups and you know building businesses and opportunities is that it's kind of become a very specific language, a very specific way of talking and thinking, a very specific kind of conversation. And I think that what happens sometimes, unfortunately, and maybe even um, you know, I don't want to say by accident, but unknowingly, is that just like a lot of things, is that when you start to engage someone who is interested in that joining that community who might not have been there before. They don't yet speak the language. They kind of you already you have that automatic assumption of like, well, they don't know what's going on. 
on so they won't be successful, right? And that might not be the case. They just need, you know, to spend a little more time in the community and they'll be right on par with everyone else and have those exact same conversations. Um, so I think that that's sometimes a hurdle for us is, you know, trying to, especially if you want to bring in the best and the brightest and the smartest ideas, how do you stay open while also, you know, keeping the kind of uh, parameters around that community, right? Um, and then the second thing I was going to say um, here in terms of challenges is that, you know, quickly when I moved here, uh, moved here, you know, everyone's like, oh, you're in the bubble now, right? Like, that's it. You know, you don't, you don't know what's going on elsewhere. And I think that I would say what my, my response would become to people is that that's only a problem if you don't recognize that that's the case, right? Like, I chose to live here because of all the great reasons we kind of just discussed. Like, why wouldn't you want to live there, right? But if I forget that that is not the experience for everyone who does live here or who lives outside of here, that's an issue. So kind of maintaining perspective, I think, is super important. Um, otherwise, you're at risk of kind of that, that thing or whatever, you know? Um, and so I'd say those are kind of two of the bigger challenges. Yeah, I'd like to think about that. I think exclusivity and that um, the a lot of people here and in the, the various communities that I'm part of do often feel excluded from the other um, bubbles. You know, there are a lot of bubbles around here. Um, one of my titles is collaborative storyteller. That's one of the things I do for Walk to Connect. Like, I, I photograph people who like stories, kind of like humans in New York, but for walking. And um, uh, I'm also a former writer and all that stuff. So, um, one woman, a, a, a Latina woman who is, well, she's, she's from Mexico and she's a monolingual Spanish speaker. And I worked with an interpreter to interview her for a story recently. And she said, I feel like a caged bird in Boulder. And that just, oh, that just, Stuck with me. We ended up training her as one human leader, and now she's she's leading these walks, and she's we're trying to help her not feel like a caged bird. But that feeling has come up over and over again in my work with various communities in this area, where people feel excluded from other scenes, or or, or as though if you're not already a member of that group, it's hard to break in. I, I have noticed that a great deal. So I think that's a major threat to our um, to our success and to our community uh, structure as a whole here. Um, and thinking of kind of smaller communities and um, you know just just access, right? So access through housing, access through um, good education. Here we're you know we're so grateful to have excellent schools in Boulder Valley School District, um, and people are welcome to come. And into them from different places because we because we have a declining school age population because it's so expensive to live here. Um, but that's another sort of threat, I think, is um, access to those good educational opportunities because they're too far away uh, from people elsewhere in the county or things like that. So I think that that feeling and the consciousness of exclusivity um, really can hurt us in a lot of ways. So I also teach a um, North American Indians, of course. And one of the things that I found so fascinating this past semester um, was the idea of community and kind of the unique identification of how distant that is from family. Um, and so in my tribal community, like the connection between family and community is far simultaneous. So that connection to community doesn't necessarily lead just because you have one. Um, so this whole idea of migration is fascinating to me to hear you all kind of talk about like moving to new spaces and somehow like um, not transferring that sense of responsibility and commitment to the community that you have left. Um, and now to help me understand that lecture so much more. Um, because the, the students I was teaching, you know, um, I gave them an article to our book chapter um, in which the People were talking about, like, you know, so and so, my sister's brother lives over there. Um, and so the elders were kind of signifying where people live. Uh, and so the students were just completely baffled. Why are they calling their neighbor their brother? Uh, and so this kind of, you know, fundamentally different way of thinking about your connections to the people who surround you, not 
that as being somebody who is different or separate from oneself. Um, but simultaneously, what I have found with the students I work with uh, is kind of the desire to acquire educational um, qualifications um, and having to be that sense of community. And what does that mean? What does that mean to my commitment? Um, how do I fulfill fill all the responsibilities and obligations to my family, i.e., my community, um, while simultaneously going to this new community where they think and view a uh, community drastically different? Um, and so I think for the Native community in particular, um, I think that's one of the biggest kind of hurdles. Um, when trying to manage and kind of relay um, to non-natives kind of a unique um, position of this ethnic and racial identity, also political identity, while also kind of relaying a multiple different identities when people don't necessarily have that same intimacy um, in the sense of the people in which they kind of walk this life and can't really relate. Because, <laughs> 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 um, so like, um, you know, as I have moved to other places, like none of the issues that you know have that were a part of these issues have ever left me. Um, you know, I still passionately care about Colorado State because Denver and State College <laughs> and you know, State College and State and Happy Valley. I will always be happy about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that sense of identity um, is kind of integrated and kind of linked into who I am as a person. And it's also why I consciously decided to stay in the group. Um, you know, I could have easily lived in Fort Collins or Loveland and, you know, kind of made that trip. So I didn't have to deal with the awkward looks and the constant questions about how I deal with the smell of breathing. Um, but I, I passionately care about the people in which in that community. Um, and I truly believe that people um, deserve quality educators and quality makers um, who fundamentally care for them on a, another level than just kind of the key and the first. Eric, I almost, I almost caught a really profound concept. I'm wondering if you can revisit it so I can really understand it. So you were saying, trying to understand, not transferring responsibility Left. Did I get all those words? Out? Did I get that right? Can well, not maybe just say it again because I, I think that's a profound concept. I'm not sure I'm grasping it, which so, is probably your point. <laughs> <laughs> generous town doing very well is something that we are constantly struggling to understand. That was the lens I was hearing you through. And I think that it has to do um, somewhat with the with the churn, with the newness of this place for all the angles that have moved here. Um, and until you had uh, really rerouted and, and connected to a place and had an invitation to serve on board or to connect with uh, older housing partners, let's say, in their foundation, uh, you can skate and you're, you're sort of given a pass in a way that you're not uh, if you live on one of the coasts. Um, when I talk about our, um, you know, one of the things we need is, is generosity. I'm careful to first say one way we are generous in this town is that we're quick volunteers. So, um, more than half of us have volunteered at some point over the last year. That may not sound like a lot, but the national average is one in four. Uh, also, I mentioned the open space program. I could mention lots of other things. Anytime the schools want to go levy or bond, 
or when we want to pass a worthy cause tax or a soda tax, um, the voters say yes. And so in that way, we are generous. Uh, we are, uh, however, uh, 44th out of 64 counties in terms of percent of our income that we give to charity uh, here in Boulder County. And we live in a low generosity state. It's in the bottom quartile out of 50 states. In fact, we're the least generous state when it comes to giving to charity of any of our contiguous neighbors. And I bet every one of you uh, <laughs> could tell me which of our neighboring states is the most generous in the country. Utah. 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 <laughs> no one ever doesn't say Utah, and that's the correct answer. <laughs> so they're more than double Colorado's uh, generosity. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the connection to religious participation is what we look at there. Uh, the city of Boulder is tied with Burlington, Vermont, for the lowest religious <coughs> participation in the nation. Uh, and so that's that's significant when it comes to, you know, what do we need? We need more than your time, we need your money. Um, <clears throat> other needs that uh, we look at is equity, you know, on many fronts, in education, in health, including mental health, in housing, and in economic mobility. Uh, certainly affordable housing, uh, that's the, there's a chart in this magazine that just looks at the hockey stick that our housing prices have been doing over the last five years. Um, and that is probably the biggest driver for all of the social issues that um, the safety net organizations are grappling with. Um, and it leads to uh, this feeling of being like a caged bird. If you're spending 75% of your family income on your rent, you certainly feel like a caged bird inside the shabby place that you're able to afford to live in. Um, so what do we need? Uh, affordable, uh, early childhood education uh, for not just the uh, people like me who married to a teacher and works a nonprofit job and remembers paying thirty thousand one year for both of our kids when one was an infant and the other was a preschool. Yeah, that was a lot of money. But I'm not here to talk about that problem. I'm here to talk about the people who are already spending seventy five percent of their income on rent and aren't even talking about uh, the free option of a two and a half hour public preschool because uh, their husbands work in free shifts and uh, they've decided that their job is to be a mom and to stay at home. And so what happens? The kid gets to be five, six years old when they show up in their first education environment, everyone is speaking a language foreign to them. It's not what they speak at home. And uh, you know, they're already at least two years behind. So um, we need uh, affordable early childhood education that is culturally relevant and full day. Um, <clears throat> we need affordable health care. Um, one of the great things that happened four years ago was that Colorado accepted the Medicaid expansion that was made possible by the Affordable Care Act. And as a result, we had 232% uh, increase in the people in Boulder County on Medicaid and CHIP Plus. Um, not to say that just having that coverage ends your affordability of healthcare problem. Obviously there's healthcare and then coverage and weak coverage and then there's strong coverage. But at any rate, that, that was a very strong result of that. But of course that's in peril at the congressional level. Um, we need relief for immigrants. Um, we have very strong leadership in this county from the VA to the local police chiefs in terms of support for our immigrant population. However, <clears throat> when ICE is able to show up at a courthouse uh, and, and pick somebody up and uh, deport them right here in Boulder, uh, that's, that's sort of hollow uh, in terms of uh, being a, a, a pattern. Uh, we need a strong, free, and inclusive press. And currently, <clears throat> there's a New York hedge fund that is holding the Daily Camera, the Times Hall, the Denver Post and about 10 other Colorado newspapers as well as papers that they hold uh, across the country, really hostage, they're bleeding them dry. And we're gonna uh, get their own life path to rob them immensely and then uh, uh, rob each of these communities of a strong, free, inclusive press. Uh, forget about trying to diversify newsrooms at this point, they're just trying to hang on to these higher level conversations about when are we going to have uh, institutions that have staff that are representative of our 
diversified populations, including media, that is to get to the diversified populations is kind of a new point when you're just struggling to hang on. Uh, and then uh, also, just the final point would be we need to be aware that our uh, our elder population is uh, growing on pace with the first world. Uh, so we think of Colorado and Boulder as a young place, Boulder in particular, average age about 34. Uh, but our 65 plus population is uh, going to double from about 45,000 in Boulder County today to over 100,000 by the time I retired. I retired at the time I 65. Uh, and so what does that mean in terms of uh, not just our you know, public uh, services, but also our attitudes, our recent Public perception survey showed that uh, less than half <coughs> of our um, population feels like we're open to uh, and, and welcoming of seniors, um, even though they're our fastest growing uh, population outside of the other, well, fastest growing age demographic. Um, <coughs> and then our survey also found that. We perceive that we are the least open uh, to uh, minorities and immigrants. Uh, so, those are several needs in our community. Chris, you were talking about um, <clears throat> how people volunteer, they're quick to volunteer in Boulder. Um, so, I want to ask that question a little bit a different way. So, everybody in here has lived in Boulder for, I mean, they've been in this program for about a year, and I would say the majority of you are an accurate statement okay cool so like they're new to boulder but the program ends this summer they'll be looking for jobs they're not new to other communities so i'm curious about this idea of how when you enter a new community can you become a member of that community is volunteering an aspect of that um if so i'd love your thoughts about that but it's kind of come from a place when you move to a new town it's easier to stay inside it's more comfortable to like stay what's what's close to you how what tips do you have for like breaking through that comfort to actually connecting with the greater community. And that's open to anybody too. I just, since you were talking about that, Chris, I wanted to give you a first shot. But. Yeah, I mean, I'd love others' perspective on this. I, I didn't realize that I hardwired my future to actually safeguard against that when I uh, enrolled as a newspaper reporter mm -hmm. and then as a employee of the Community Foundation. I've never had a job. It wasn't the perfect way to get to know my community. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I, I, but now, you know, it's interesting as a father with two kids in the elementary school where my uh, wife teaches, uh, you know, you, you suddenly pick up new peer groups that are fellow parents, you know, that are in the same, you know, have kids in the same class as your kids. And suddenly you look at these like totally cocoon locked, you know, like uh, I get invited to a breakfast once a month, you know, from a, a guy I know, and he's like, yeah, well, we all just get together because, you know, we work at home, and we, we kind of, like, we're starved for social interaction. I'm like, I, I don't think I have time for this. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> and I think that's actually a lot of people's experience. It's so I'm curious for insight from people who know what that's like, but I, I would say, um, uh, any opportunity that you have to um, meet people, you know, outside your comfort zone, and it, everything is relationships. I mean, it's interesting. We were talking about Joe. You were talking about like when someone uh, doesn't seem to really know the language of entrepreneurship, and you're encouraging this attitude of like, you know, like. Hang, hang with them. They're, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna get there quicker than we think. I'm thinking of this kind of contrast between relationships and ideas. And I'm there thinking about so much of what you're talking about is like there is, there is no uh, place where you leave the relationships of the self, the family, the community, right? Um, but this is a place where people do pick up. And your question supposes that many of you will be picking up and planting yourselves in new communities. As educators, you've got really a, a ticket to meet your community. Um, I mean, my, my wife can't go anywhere. She's been teaching in this town for 20 years without running into 
you know, someone who she's taught or, or who's the parent or someone who she's taught. And so it feels like a very rich community. I would just suggest um, picking a, a place that you love and, and just making a commitment to grow roots there. Um, and, and you will be a forever adored uh, asset in your community that is um, really more revered. We give short shrift to this idea that we don't value educators. Um, but uh, take it from a spouse of a good one who's been here for 20 years. We, we value our good educators. Yeah, and, and education is actually the most public career you could possibly choose. So meaning that you are not alone all day. You are with people all day. And by default, you are with their families all day. So you will not be alone. <laughs> and all my career, you will be around people. You're, I think, the challenge. And so when I was 21, I, I'm from here. I moved away, I went to Portland, Oregon. I lived in Portland for my 20s, and it was awesome. And I got involved with, you know, I volunteered for political campaigns, and I did stuff, and I wrote for a magazine, and I did all kinds of stuff. And you can do that too, like you can go and do that. You can take this education and go do, do stuff, right? And I just, so I can't relate to your question at all. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it, it, choosing education specifically as a field is that, you know, it is, it's an automatic ticket to understanding whatever community you choose to be part of. And the, the issues and, and challenges of those families. And the, I mean, it, it'll also give you insight into how you can contribute beyond the classroom. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah. So uh, on this one, I, I'd say that, um, yeah, I feel like you have these two things. That's, that's cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, no, it's that, I guess, first it kind of comes back to me, like that shared experience and how you can be as big or as small as you want to think about that community. And I think like step one is identifying for yourself, like what interests me or what, what kind of community do I want to be a part of? Or, you know, what are those questions you need to ask yourself first? And then I think you need to go find them. And I think you find them in the small place first, right? And then grow from there, right? I think it just takes a few people to start building that experience around, um, you know, someone's a connector in that group who can introduce you to someone else. And then it kind of builds from there. Um, and you know, thankfully when I moved here, I think similar to the job, you know, I was kind of put into the natural youth community, which happens to be a big involved in. Um, you know, that's luck, I guess, to a certain extent. But uh, when, you know, what really kind of brought me to, to meet more people was going to an event and having one person say, you should meet this person. And then suddenly I met that person, and that person was like, you should meet this person, right? And you just kind of build from that small group to that bigger group. Um, but it comes back to kind of, I think, identifying for yourself where do you want to participate. Um, and then the second thing I want to say was, you know, I think to the broader theme on this question, but even more uh, high level, is just I honestly feel like the role of technology can be huge here. Um, you talk about leaving your family but still having responsibility and staying connected. My entire family lives in New Jersey. Like, that's everybody grandma, mom, dad, sister pregnant, like, you know, everything that I have on the family side is there. But I feel so connected to them still. I mean, we have our, our group chat for our family and like FaceTime. Um, I, you know, I have means to fly home when there's important events. Um, so I think there's ways to like leverage tools in a more positive way. Technology, it can be both bad and good. Um, and the one thing I wanted to mention for like a specific option is meetup. I think that that's been huge for me. Um, just go on meetup.com and like, it's amazing to see how many people, even in a small you know, county or city like Boulder, are starting their own like little groups. And some of them are 10 people, but that's all they need, right? And it's like, we're the, you know, the climbing something, climbing and coffee group, right? And it's like, we meet at the gym, we climb for an hour and then we get coffee. That's, that's what those people do, they go over and So I think that there's there's options out there to go find uh, ways to tap in. Um, I think that on more meta level, um, <laughs> I think also offering the community to define the community for you um, is really helpful. Um, oftentimes when people talk about wanting to go and work with um, indigenous communities, often kind of preface the conversation with 
So making assumptions and judgments for the first year. Because mm -hmm. um, then the community gets to define and um, actually um, avoid any type of prejudicial or assumptions that could be harmful um, of the community. I think in Colorado in particular, there's some neighborhoods and uh, communities that have, don't have necessarily the best reputation, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the people, right, like, Poverty, violence, and all those things aren't inherent to any culture, uh, and they're not inherent to any person. Um, and so, allowing kind of the individual and community uh, to kind of define itself um, for you, I think it has been tremendously helpful for me. Um, it has helped me stay out of sticky waters uh, when it comes to because um, I like having worked with extremely vulnerable populations. Uh, I think I'm always fearful of like the privileges that I carry or that I think those to me and kind of harm. Uh, being an educator and kind of with the tragic history of education um, in kind of vulnerable communities, um, kind of the impact that I think, um, the harmful impact that can be kind of created uh, is something that I try to always be cognizant of and allow um, the students and families to kind of bear witness um, and kind of reveal themselves to me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, ask yeah, a question to follow up on that in terms of the building that community gives you the opportunity. Because I completely agree with you that I think the community should define itself and it always works best that way. Because then, again, everyone's kind of sharing in the kind of development of that value system or, or why that community matters to them. But do you feel that maybe, uh, my opinion, I guess I'll say, is that there needs to be someone leading that. There needs to be someone guiding the community in its effort to kind of define itself. Because, or at the very least, if you let it go, like someone will rise to the top and if you help kind of put the structure, if you want to call it structure, around that community. Do you find the need for that? I mean, that, that's why I think, like, you know, sometimes you need a pesky example here, but like, you know, one person went out and said, here's kind of the community I want to build. Come join me and then let's do it together. You know, it didn't just happen by, you know, people just met and said, hey, let's build this community. You know, you're talking about the difference between uh, original startup community and an original uh, multi-generational that's fair, yeah. <laughs> uh, ethnic community. Yeah. Those are two very different concepts of community, right? Yeah. It was the difference between an idea and going into a space to do something. Right. Uh, right. Because right. there's that question was like, you know. Um, some of you all might get jobs in um, violence, um, um, right? And so, like, there's a history of violence. There's a large um, um, impoverished community, um, and so kind of you can allow that to kind of paint a depiction that every student that you interact with is going to engage in violence, <laughs> um, and that their parents are carrying guns. You know, allow your imagination to kind of just wander. Right, or you can allow that parent to show up as an actual parent who is healthy and has uh, the capacity to care and love, and somebody who has a lot to care for their child. Um, and so, allowing them to kind of define um, what violence um, and allowing yourself to kind of to avoid kind of any kind of stereotypes. Because um, I think, um, well, and there's also cultural uh, brokers as well as any. Of um, those individuals who are trying to um, rid the community of kind of all these negative kind of conversations. So, yeah, I think there are like individuals that you can kind of connect with. Um, but I think ultimately, fundamentally, I think research in kind of, unfortunately, the media uh, can kind of um, sway perspective. Um, it can be problematic for educators who are entering into um, vulnerable communities. Yeah, there's a really important push pull there where you go in with assets that you're prepared to, to provide. Um, and the listening and the receptivity to the environment and the community you're in is absolutely a fundamental part of that. Yeah, yeah, in my own work, I've seen it on, on several levels with so we use meetup as, as a very important tool for um, creating our walk, building our walk community here in, in Boulder and actually all of the we have these walk to connect meetup groups. 
And, um, and so I see both of these things because there are people who come to me and who come to our groups to say, I'm offering this, you know, and people come to them. And then there are people like the woman I mentioned who feels like a huge part, uh, to whom we go and say, you are a leader in your community. How can we help you do what you love, walking and being in nature, with more people in your community, your way? So there's this, that both of those things are absolutely essential. And I think we could use both of our Fantastic. Yeah. We're going to press pause right now. We're going to take a five minute break. If you need to use the restroom, uh, get a drink, uh, go ahead and do that. But when we come back, please stay. I think you're in good groups right now. Um, we're going to have each of the panel members join a table, and you're going to have a small conversation for about 15 minutes, and we'll rotate until you've gotten through all of them. Um, let's take a five-minute break. We'll start sharp at 3.05 uh, with a small group conversation. <clears throat> Absolutely. 